Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Our special guest on today's show is Jim Kuzis. Jim is a legend in the leadership world. He and his partner, Barry Posner, wrote the Leadership Challenge, which has been used as a manual and a guide by leaders all over the world, having sold millions of copies. Incredibly excited to get into Jim's world, but before we do that, it's a Leadership Hacker News. What is it that makes some teams and some project teams just absolutely rock and roll where others really flounder? Well, the principle of tribe lays at the heart of it. In the world that we're working in now, even in a remote environment, as often the case may be, your task is to find new ways as a leader to develop that sense of tribe to your team, no matter what they're working on, so that they stay with you and operate at their most effective. And doing this well will help you keep morale high, productivity at its best, and ensuring your team stay with you. So where do people get that sense of tribal belonging? Well, a sense of tribal belonging usually comes from our four key sources. Shared purpose, unique contribution, pride and gratitude. So let's dig into them. Everybody understands purpose. And when we're talking about a grand cause, purpose becomes very visible and very obvious. But what if your organization's role is not to eradicate diseases or fight poverty or clean oceans? Purpose can be found in the smallest of things. It's the why we do what we do every day. It might be to solve a given problem in an industry. Whatever the purpose is, it makes teams raise their heads high, see the horizon. So whatever purpose your team might claim, take the opportunity to explore this, link it to your vision and reinforce it every single day. Ownership is key here. Owning purpose usually means that teams consistently keep their purpose at the front of everything they do. If purpose says why, then a tribe also wants to feel the how they go about achieving it and how they deliver purpose. It's the mark of that tribe, it differentiates others from other tribes. Leadership ownership is key here. So this is how leaders relate to employees, their philosophies, how they engage in communications, the autonomy they give to their team, and how they deal with diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. And all brings this together in a society that they can call team or tribe. No matter what contribution or challenging factors you might face, every single individual has a unique contribution to play. If they feel it, they become part of the belonging of that tribe and that sense of ownership. Everyone wants to feel proud of their achievements and the mark that they're leaving on the world. And knowing that they're contributing to something uniquely valuable is an important part of tribal community. But they need to feel that that individual contribution is important as well. So people generally have an intrinsic sense of pride based on their own self-awareness and allowing them to show that pride goes a long way. And demonstrating pride is not necessarily about bragging or self-promotion. You may feel proud even if somebody else is speaking on the achievements of your team. Communicating the story, allowing others to feel part of the journey that you're on can also build pride with those in your business that are not directly correlated to your team. And as you offer rewards for people's achievements, provide consistent updates and show the real world the influence they're directly having. Praising interactions, letting people know their sense of fulfillment. People can feel grateful for what is beyond expectations, outside of the norm or simply out of the blue. It's the we have your back feeling, which is to put the proof in the times of need. The past 12 months in particular have given an exceptionally high number of opportunities to test whether we re can count on others. Gratitude is also letting people know that. You may feel grateful for something your leader has done, or your peers have done, or your team have done, but have you really let them know? In my experience, gratitude doesn't come from a major game-changing heroic act. It comes from small, 
unexpected and absolutely sincere acts from one person to another. Behavioural science has shown over and over again that helping others benefits both the helper and the recipient. If the team members are doing that for each other, then they really feel that they belong to the tribe. If your team are your people, then prove it to them. Today's environment makes it more likely that people will look for that sense of belonging alongside you and your team and your business so that they can feel appreciated and feel a sense of loyalty both ways. And as a leader, you can give them that sense of tribe, the belonging, and proactively focusing on purpose, their unique contribution, being proud of the opportunity, and demonstrating gratitude. That's been the Leadership Hacking News. If you have any news, insights, or stories, please get in touch. The guest on today's show needs no introduction if you've ever read about leadership. Jim Cousins and his co-author Barry Posner wrote the award-winning and best-selling book, The Leadership Challenge, selling millions around the world. Jim's work's impacted the way we think and behave as leaders, and he's been named as one of the top leadership gurus globally. The Wall Street Journal cited him as one of the best executive directors in the world. And Jim, it is an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on the Leadership Hacker podcast. Steve, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. My pleasure. Delighted to be here. So when we first met, you told me you've been thinking about leadership ever since you were a young kid as a Eagle Scout when you were selected in John F. Kennedy's Honor Guard. And I, I recall you telling me that it was that call to action from Kennedy of ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country that really inspired you to then think about joining the Peace Corps. Maybe just give us a little bit of the backstory of how that all evolved. Certainly, Steve. Th thanks for that uh, reminder of my early past. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and my father worked for the U.S. government. He started out as a file clerk and worked his way up to Deputy Assistant Secretary of Labor before he retired. And living in that area, we had the opportunity to visit the memorials and the museums and all the sites that one sees in pictures and as tourists tour around and visit. And I had the great pleasure of of living in that community and, and being in Washington, D.C. at least once a week. And so I was steeped in, in the history of the country and the, and the values and the vision of the country, visiting all of those institutions as a young, young person. And uh, it inspired me to continue that work, particularly when I was selected to be in John F. Kennedy's Honor Guard as an Eagle Scout at 15 years of age. And I can still remember that very cold winter day in January, standing there before the reviewing stand where then President John F. Kennedy and his family and his, some of his cabinet members watched as the parade went by. And his call to action, as you mentioned, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, stuck with me and stays with me to this day. And uh, there probably isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about that sense of calling for all of us as human beings to look to serve others. So I aspired initially to be an ambassador. When I went to university, I studied political science, wanted to uh, join the Peace Corps after I got out, which I did. I became a teacher in the Peace Corps. And as a teacher, it changed my career aspirations. I realized the impact that one individual could have on, on young people. And so I wanted to continue that work. When I came back to the U.S., I looked for a job in education because I didn't have a teaching credential. They wouldn't let me teach kids, <laughs> but they would let me teach adults. So I got a job working in training and development uh, in human resource development, organization development with a consulting firm that was working with the War on Poverty, another program in the Johnson administration, uh, which uh, was for young people wanting to uh, be in, come involved in community activities that would help uh, people in the United States get out of poverty. And so I worked for this organization, training people who were in those organizations in communication skills, team building skills, leadership skills. And that was the turning point for me. That was back in 1969, uh, 70. In 72, I was offered a job at San Jose State University to direct a grant project on met with mental health teams helping to develop their uh, sense of teamwork in mental health agencies in the nine Bay Area counties around San Francisco. And in that process, met the dean of the business school at Santa Clara University, 
which was just down the road from San Jose State. And uh, he asked me if I'd come direct the Executive Development Center at Santa Clara University, which I did. And while I was unpacking boxes at my office at Santa Clara University, I hear this knock on my door and I turn around and there's this very tall gentleman in the doorway and he said, you're in my office. Well, excuse <laughs> me, I thought this was my office. <laughs> I, I, the dean told me this was my office. Then he laughed and he said, it is your office. It used to be my office. I've moved to another building. But uh, welcome to Santa Clara University. And if you uh, want to meet some people, uh, have some lunch at the faculty club, uh, get a tour of the campus, uh, please let me know, and I'd be glad to talk to you and walk you around and introduce you to folks. That was Barry Posner. And I took him up on his offer, and as we wandered around campus and and talked about where I came from, my background, his background, our interests, we found that we had some common interests. At that time, it was around managerial values, and that led to a 39-year now collaboration yeah, it's amazing. There's not many relationships that last for 39 years, and therefore <laughs> something's got to be right about the chemistry. It, it is. We're very different personalities and very different people, and I think that's part of why it works. We're not trying, you know, he's a very funny guy. He likes to crack people up almost, you know, every minute there's a laugh when you're with Barry practically, which is great. Uh, I'm not that person. Uh, I'm more of the serious type. But I do enjoy his company. He enjoys mine. Uh, our families have become close friends. He, he, uh, they are our closest uh, friends as a couple, he and his wife, Jackie, and my wife, Tay, and I. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And your and Barry's rise to leadership greatness came about when you published the Leadership Challenge. And you'd done plenty of work before then. But this really kind of excelled you and Barry into the spotlight, if you like, into the the global arena and be really interested. How did that come about? Well, Barry and I worked together uh, at Santa Clara University through the Executive Development Center. And I, I organized the programs, created the programs, recruited faculty to be part of those programs. And there was one seminar in particular that we did with Tom Peters. Tom Peters, the uh, co-author of In Search of Excellence with Bob Waterman. This was back in the mid 80s. Right. And Tom had just published a, that book and we invited him to come to Santa Clara University. This was before, before his fees went through the roof and we couldn't afford him. But we, we invited him to come, <laughs> come to the university and, and do a seminar. He was so popular, we invited him back. And this time we invited him back for a, a, a whole day event. And, and then a second day, Barry and I were going to do. Well, Barry and I had some common interest around managerial values and managerial, we called it managerial excellence at the time. And uh, But we didn't have a book at the time, and we didn't have a theory necessarily. So as we were preparing for that, I, I recall very clearly it was around the time that uh, countries were preparing for the Olympics, the Summer Olympics, which was a couple of years away. And we were I was hearing a program on personal best athletic Achievements. So, you know, when athletes have their personal best time or their personal best score, uh, they there were there were all people always talking about that in relation to the Olympics. And it just occurred to us: why don't we ask the same question about leadership? Tell us about a time when you were at your personal best as a leader. And we started doing that in preparation for that seminar that we're doing with Tom Peters. And we asked people to do that exercise prior to coming to the second day of the seminar. And then we broke them into small groups and they talked about their personal best leadership experiences. And they posted them on newsprint sheets in the halls of Kenna Hall there at Santa Clara University. And as we walked down and reviewed, there's approximately 80 people attending and they were broken into about 10 groups. We looked at all these flip charts and they had very similar words and phrases on them. And that was the moment we realized, you know, there's some common themes across individual stories of personal best leadership experiences. Right. And so Barry and I took those case studies that people wrote about their personal best leadership experiences and started to essentially sort all the behaviors into different piles, literally three by five cards on a big conference room table, Kenna Hall 107. And we sorted them into piles and eventually came up with a five-factor model called the five practices of exemplary leadership. And then we created a, a tool to research it, uh, to validate the model. 
asking people to re- answer a, a series of questions or essentially rate a, a, like a 360 assessment to rate themselves and have other people rate them on these dimensions. So is that the birth of the leadership practices inventory? Yes, the leadership practices inventory was developed as a research tool initially and later after we had validated and done a number of analyses to to simplify it, we were able to uh, develop it as, an, as a 360 assessment people use in leadership development. And what were some of the, the patterns and the behaviors that you noticed that were reoccurring? Well, one of the things that we noticed, Steve, was that every single case involves some kind of challenge, adversity, difficulty. Ima- imagine people now during the pandemic writing about some of their current experiences. It was that kind of a challenge that people wrote about, Mm. whether it was a turnaround development of a new business, uh, uh, literally a, a natural disaster, destroying a business and then reviving, coming back from that experience. Uh, So we noticed that. And, and so, so we, we, we discovered that challenge is the opportunity for greatness that, that people, don't do their best when things are calm and steady and, you know, normal times. We, we yearn for those normal times. It helps us relax a little bit. But interestingly enough, we don't necessarily do our best at leading when things are normal. Right. People need to challenge the process. So we came up with a practice called challenge the process. Another thing we noticed is that people mentioned how clear they were about their values and beliefs, what they stood for. And also clear about where they wanted to go. The outcomes were very clear to them, what they wanted to achieve. So came we, we developed two other practices, model the way and inspire a shared vision from those observations. And then a number of people, I remember Bill Flanagan, who was one of the people we interviewed, and we said, Bill, tell us about your personal best. And he said, I can't. And I said, what, what do you mean you can't? And he said, uh, because it wasn't my personal best, it was our personal best. It wasn't me, it was us. Mm. And I was just, it stopped me in my tracks. I, I said, wow, that's really an important observation. You can't do it alone. You can't get extraordinary things done in organizations all by yourself. That's our practice now. We call enable others to act. And along the way, when you have faced difficulties, you, you, you face failure. Sometimes you uh, face other challenges than, than just the initial one as you try to innovate and improve. And so people need encouragement in order to continue down that path. So there's a lot of celebration, a lot of recognition of people's achievements, uh, small as well as large, uh, which we now call encourage the heart. So the practices emerge from that kind of an analysis of what people told us about those challenging situations that they were engaged in model inspire challenge enable and encourage i love it it's a really great framework one that's also stood the test of time because in having read the early leadership challenge and then the latest version i just noticed the way that you shift the stories so the framework stays the same but you you're able to tap into great other stories to illustrate the change in how we lead as well uh that's a very important observation steve one of the things that people always ask us is what's new, what's different about leadership now than it was 35, 40 years ago when you first wrote the book and started doing the research. And we said, well, the, the content of leadership has remained relatively stable over all these years. What's changed is the context. And sometimes we confuse context with content. We think that if a new challenge comes along, like a pandemic, now, as compared to the challenges that people faced 40 years ago, somehow leadership practices also have to change. Not necessarily. Why would that be the case? Leaders face challenges millennium before Mm. today's current challenge. What has become evident, however, is the importance of some of those more than others. For example, Steve, uh, contextually, because we're all facing a life and death situation together right now. Uh, And everyone has been impacted in some very serious ways. Many people I know, and perhaps you know, have had loved ones who passed away or friends who have passed away. So it's a, it's a very, very difficult, very difficult time. And consequently 
people have told us that they want a lot more caring and support from their leaders and encouragement from their leaders than they did before. Uh, our data shows us that the two characteristics of, a, of admired leaders, a separate piece of research that we did, have done, that has increased more than the others in terms of the, its importance to individuals is caring and support. So contextually, sometimes things become more important, but caring and support has always been there as a part of what good leaders do. That's right. Yeah. People often get confused still to this day between the, the notion of leadership and management. And I know this is a really cliche subject, but management's a relatively new thing. You know, we, we invented this a hundred years ago to get some control over stuff, whereas leadership has been going on for millennia. Well, le leadership has been something we've always yearned for and needed particularly during difficult and challenging times. And you're right, uh, the, the notion of, of a bureaucracy or a hierarchy ha has emerged, came out of uh, government initially and into business as a result of uh, trying to get better organized, if you will, and become more productive and efficient. One of the things that you mentioned in the Leadership Challenge is this strength out of adversity and learning from adversity. And I just wanted to share some research with you and get your perspective on this. So I've been researching people from ethnic minorities, people who have had to transverse from different locations because of either poverty or war. And what you notice is that there's massive, massive leadership value in it, the fact that people have already got these foundations that they've carried with them for whatever having faced into adversity whatever that may be whether it be through you know, experiences or challenges that they faced there are foundations that they have there that some of us just take years to develop that they have an innate resource to tap into what's your perspective on that jim well diversity equity inclusion is one of the major major social trends that uh, we're currently it, it, it's always been there again it's not something that's not been there and is brand new right now, but it's increased in its importance uh, with Black Lives Matter here in this country uh, and globally uh, and uh, Asian hate that uh, we've experienced here in the United States and other parts of the world. Right. Diversity, equity, inclusion has become a, a topic we now talk about daily. And uh, there are more initiatives to try to do something about this. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it is, a challenge that leaders are facing uh, more today than they have and addressing it head on. Uh, it, and so it's an important issue. One of the things that we all need to get comfortable with, Steve, however, is in, you're absolutely right. People from diverse backgrounds bring different kinds of experiences in their own lives that they can contribute to the improvement of organizations. Without doubt. Without a doubt. And, and diversity improves innovation because of those different perspectives. Right. They have different ideas about how to do things, uh, different experiences that inf inform innovation and creativity. However, it's going to be more challenging initially to get to where we can perform at a higher level with more diverse groups. Why? Because people don't know each other that well. Uh, we don't we don't always know we, because we haven't asked and we haven't seen these diverse perspectives. And until we get to a place where we have a better understanding of each other and feel more comfortable with each other, it's going it, to if you if you do take a look at performance, it tends to decline initially, but then becomes both more a group becomes more innovative and creative and they become higher performers in a more diverse setting once they have gotten through that period of time of, of learning to learning more about each other and learning to trust each other. And I should imagine it's part of that bumping into some of those unconscious biases, yes. becoming that they're recognized biases and learning them and then relearning how the difference can really make a difference. Absolutely. And one of the things that's really important in that process is for leaders to listen. Uh, uh, one one of the things in our research uh, and others is that the more deeply you listen and listen with empathy, the higher the per the performance as a leader. Uh, one of our colleagues, Rich Wellen at uh, DDI Development Dimensions International, did some research on this topic, and he he reported that leaders who master listening and responding with empathy perform more than forty percent higher 
than those who uh, don't master listening and responding with empathy. That's a massive shift, isn't it? Massive. massive. I mean, forty percent is really tangible. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One of the other things that comes out in your work and research over the decades is how passionate you are about purpose and linking not just purpose to people's work, but to people's lives. Tell us a little bit about how that might help me as a leader. Well, purpose gives us a reason for doing what we're doing. It helps us to answer the question, why? Why are you doing what you're doing? And it also, because we have that sense of purpose, increases determination. So it makes us more life. We're clear about where we want to go and what we want in our lives and why we are doing what we're doing. We're going to be much more determined and much more dedicated, much more committed. So organizations, leaders and organizations that help people both to understand how their purpose fits with the larger organizational purpose and how in this organization you can live out your personal purpose, we'll find that Employees are significantly more committed. They're more likely to work together as teams. They see their work as more meaningful. They have a sense that they're making a contribution. So it has a lot of positive effects. And in the world of education, interestingly, uh, students who have this sense of self-transcendent purpose for learning, that is, I'm learning this subject matter, not just for me to get a grade and graduate, but for me to make a contribution to others. If they have that sense of self-transcendent purpose for learning, they're more likely to continue learning when the task is tedious and difficult. So it has a lot of positive effects, whether it's at work or whether it's in the classroom, Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in the community. Uh, If I could use an analogy to help people understand this, uh, think about having to put a jigsaw puzzle together. Let's imagine we had a box of a thousand pieces uh you know of it for a jigsaw puzzle right and uh, a leader came along and dumped them on the table in front of us and said okay put it together put this puzzle together and walked away yeah i can imagine what 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 would be the first thing that you would want to know why yeah so why is this important Mm -hmm. anything else you'd like to know or see what's the reason i'm going to do it what am i going to see when it's done what am I going to see when it's done? What's what, Show me the cover of the box top so that I, I can see the finished finish puzzle. Then I can have a better sense of what I'm trying to put together. What happens in organizations is people are given a piece of a puzzle. It's called a job. And they're told, okay, now put this piece in the puzzle without ever being shown the box top, without ever being shown the end result. Hmm. Consequently, It takes more time. One struggles, has more frustration, often gets into more conflict with other people because they don't know where they fit. If we would just simply show that box stock to people when we give them a job or talk about their work, it would be more likely that they would be more involved, more committed, more dedicated, and also have a sense that they're making a contribution to the finished product, to the end result, to the destination, the organization or the team is trying to go in. Mm. So I think understanding for, for leaders to understand that it's our natural inclination to want to know where we fit in the overall big picture and where what we do fits in that overall big picture. Leaders would be a lot more effective. Uh, unfortunately, most communication in organization only about according to uh, another uh, colleague of ours, uh, John Cotter has yeah. done done research on communicating vision in an organization, did a study and found that only 0.58% of communication market share, if you will, inside an organization is about the vision of the organization. Wow. That, that's less than 1%. Mm. We figure it needs to be for senior leaders, at least 25% of your time needs to be spent on communicating the larger vision of the organization and where we're headed, why we're doing what we're doing. What do you think the reason is that organizations and maybe leaders don't give it as much attention, Jim? It's very challenging to do, we find in our research. It's very difficult to master this particular practice, which we call Inspire Shared Vision. Uh, And and, and, in digging into that and trying to figure out why that is, 
what we discover is that it's more about communicating the vision than it is about having it. So leaders can be very clear in their own minds about where we want to go and what we want to create. But getting it out of their heads and into the heads and hearts of those on their teams is a more challenging effort. So it's largely about communication. Mm. And so when thinking about one's own development as a leader, think about how can I communicate where we are wanting to go in the future, whether it's a month from now, five months, five years from now, 15 years from now, where we want to go in the future. How can I communicate that in such a way that other people can see themselves in that picture? Let me use another analogy. Uh, I'll, I'll pick a city other than London or San Francisco. <laughs> That's, I think, uh, uh, when I say Paris, France, what first comes to your mind? The Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower. So that's a physical place, right? Yep. Did anything else come to mind when you think about Paris? Relaxing, coffee, streets, ambience. Yep, exactly. Did did it occur, did, did you um, have pop into your mind the square kilometers or the population of the city of Paris? No, not really. <laughs> no. Strangely enough, right? Those are numbers. Those are, those are numbers that, you know, and so when we... Leaders often, when they talk about vision, talk about numbers. They talk about financial outcomes. Yeah, that's right. Or they talk about uh, quantities of things. They should be talking about the Eiffel Tower, and they should be talking about coffee and walking down the streets and, 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 and enjoying the museums and the sights of the city and the smells and the, that, that baguette of bread or the croissant you have in the morning uh, over that cappuccino or that uh, espresso. That's the kind of things leaders need to get comfortable with talking about. It's not so much about the numbers. It's about the story that's not been told yet, right? Yeah, exactly. And what it will be like when we have attained our aspirations as an organization or as a team. Mm. That's a really great way of um, framing it. Thank you for that, Jim. I love that. You're welcome. So you wrote your latest book, Everyday People, Extraordinary Leadership, which I love, by the way. So this is how to make a difference regardless of your title, role or authority. And for me, this just absolutely illustrates that leadership is everybody's job. Absolutely. One of the things that when we initially wrote our first edition, we were talking about managerial excellence. And that was what was in our heads. But what we quickly, quickly realized was that the stories that people were telling us were not just about ma being managers in organizations. They were often stories about climbing and the, being the first on a team to uh, ascend a particular mountain peak or uh, the, what they did in their community or what they did with, uh, as a coach of a team uh, of young people. And it, it occurred to us that when, when people are talking about leadership, they often think just about organizational leadership, just about being a manager. But we didn't explore it as deeply as we did with this current book. And we just decided that we would write about people who may be managers in another walk of their life, but the stories that they were telling us about their personal best were only about experiences outside of having a title of manager, director, managing director inside an organization. Yeah. And what we, we also took our data and we have about 5 million people in a database and we just isolated those individuals who were identified as individual contributors. They didn't have direct reports, but they were project leaders on teams or they were people who took initiative inside an organization and, and emerged as leaders and we asked those people they worked with to give feedback to that individual contributor on the same five practices of exemplary leadership using the leadership practices inventory. And we found the identical pattern that we see with those who have managerial positions. And that is the more frequently they as peers engaged other peers, the more frequently they used the five practices of exemplary leadership, more likely it was that they would be viewed as effective leaders. They would have teams which had higher team spirit. People would feel more committed to the organization. Turnover would be lower. A lot of those same measures which we would use with managers are also true for individual contributors who lead peers. 
I love that because I've been talking about the fact that for me and having my experiences in coaching and working with great leaders around the world, leadership isn't a job title, it's a behavior. But what you've done is quantify that with some real data. That's right. We feel exactly as you do. Leadership is a set of skills and abilities. It's a set of behaviors and actions. And people are more likely to follow, if you will, more likely to be engaged with leaders who more frequently demonstrate the kinds of practices that other people are, when when they demonstrate those behaviors, are more likely to want to become engaged with that uh, leader in an organization. Hmm. One of the things, though, that uh, we, we also discovered is peer leaders need to work a little bit harder than managers to get the same kind of uh, engagement. Interesting. Yeah. So it, if you, if you were to look at uh, our bar charts and you would see this perfect up and to the right, the more frequently leaders engaged in behaviors. But if a manager can get uh, say 51% of people to uh, feel engaged when they do this uh, at a seven or an eight, it takes a peer leader a nine and a 10 level of frequency to get to that same level. So you have to work a lot harder. Is that the yes, assumed responsibility that comes with the manager label? I think, yeah, people assume, well, this person is a manager and they're my manager. And it, you know, that there's sort of the, the, the role that I'm in the role that they're in, I'm supposed to be following this person. Hmm. Uh, so you have the benefit of the, uh, of the position uh, whereas with peers, people kind of look and say, well, you're my peer. What? Who made you the leader of this project? Who made you the leader of this organization? Who? So you just have to, it's just a little bit more energy, a little bit more effort into it than you might if you had the benefit of a title. Mm, next, there's a sense. And of course, the whole principle about leadership, and you call this out in chapter seven of your book, is leadership development starts with self-development and that that's where leadership really starts. So if I was a leader listening to this and I wanted to kind of kickstart that self-discovery of me, if I was a little bit stuck right now, what would be your counsel to me? Well, the first thing I would recommend you do is to believe in yourself. Now that may sound patently obvious, but I, one of the things we did find in our research is that, uh, People who have a growth mindset, that is a belief that I can learn to lead, I can change my behavior, are more likely to be viewed by others as effective leaders than those who have a fixed mindset. Definitely, yeah. So if, if you, you need to believe in yourself, you need to believe that you can. Uh, and the next thing, if you get over that hurdle and say, yeah, I can grow, I can develop as a leader, what would what, what should you do? should you do? First, I would suggest that you write a credo memo, that you sit down and clarify for yourself what the values and beliefs are that should guide your actions and decisions. I love that. Yeah. What are those five to seven principles that we, I should follow and my team should follow? Leaders who are clear about their, what we call leadership philosophy, which is a combination of values and vision together, are much more likely to be viewed as effective leaders and much more likely to have engaged teams. The second thing I'd say is to do the life exercise, L-I-F-E. L is for lessons, I is for ideals, F is for feelings, and E is for evidence. What are the lessons that you would like people to say they learn from you? What are the ideals that you would like people to recognize you believe in? What are the feelings you would like other people to have when you, they are around you? And what's the evidence that you have made a difference? Imagine five, 10 years from now, you've won the leader of the year award. What would those lessons, ideals, feelings, and evidence be that people would talk about? Mm. Do that exercise. And cognitively, of course, having that positive affirmation to start the journey in the right direction, right? Absolutely. It gives you a, mm. what's called often in the literature an ideal self. What is your ideal self around these particular dimensions? And then using that, 
framework for yourself to ask yourself and hopefully get some feedback from others. And how am I doing right now on that? Hmm. Uh, and what can I do today to act on that so that I make sure that five years, 10 years from now, people say those things about me. Yeah. Love it. People tell those stories. Uh, and so you create, as, as you say, you create this sense of who you want to become and that helps you to determine what you need to do to grow and develop, believing in yourself that you can and having principles that will guide you along the way. And then I would hire a coach. Yeah. I would engage uh, in some kind of leadership development activity starting at, a, at the earliest possible age. So thinking about yourself, Jim, what is it that keeps you curious? What is it that keeps you so passionate about what you do? The stories that people tell me, uh, I, I just enjoy so much hearing when I ask people, well, tell me about the, the time when you were at your best as a leader. What did you do? And and people's eyes light up. They get it, very expressive. Uh, I haven't found a person who can't tell me at least one story. Initially, we say, well, gee, I don't know, you know, personal best. I just they, they pause for a moment. But once they get going, once mm. they start to talk about that experience, well, I can remember a time when I was... Uh, you know, I was coaching my uh, son's tennis team and uh, this and, and they, they they begin to just get really, really passionate about that. Or I remember the time when, you know, when uh, I was told, you know, I had two years to turn the operation around or we were going to shut it down. And that really energized me. And I began to think about all the different things we could do. And they just start to be so expressive about that, that that that's what keeps me going is it's the energy i get from other people when they tell those stories and by you translating those stories for others it kind of keeps the the fuel and the energy going doesn't it so thank you for that yeah you're, oh you're very welcome it's a delight to do it so i'm going to turn the lens now a little on you and this is going to be really challenging for you because i suspect of all the guests that we've had on the show so far you have probably had experienced much more leadership experiences and challenges throughout your career than most but i'm going to try and ask you to distill your leadership thinking your tip, top tips ideas or tools down to your top three leadership hacks, Jim. What would they be? Well, I think we already talked about two of them, and I just add what would add one more. I, the, the credo exercise, the sense of values and beliefs. It, one of the things that we know is that being clear about personal values leads to higher level personal commitment. It's more important to know your own values initially than it is to know the organization's values. So do that credo exercise. Do some exercise where you clarify values and beliefs and the life exercise, which will LIFE, uh, lessons, ideals, feelings, and evidence. Those two hacks will help you get started on creating an ideal self and understanding of your own values. Sure. The third thing I would say is that in every interaction with every person, just ask yourself this question. What can I do in this moment? to make the other person with whom I'm interacting feel more powerful, efficacious, and capable, perhaps more than they even thought they could, after this interaction is over. Really powerful thought, that. If, if we could all just stop, in, particularly as leaders, but just as human beings, mm. and say, when I'm interacting with this individual, what can I do to help this person feel better about themselves, to help this person feel more successful, to, to feel that they're more capable and more powerful? If people walked away from any any leader feeling that way, just imagine how much more they would feel engaged than if they walked away feeling, well, I just got put down by my boss or reprimanded or uh, not listened to. Yeah, I love that. And very powerful as well in the process. Absolutely. So you, Absolutely. you come away feeling not only have you helped somebody, but in doing so, that feeling of gratitude is going to be a self-fulfilling energy boost for us all absolutely the next part of the show plays straight back into ironically what we talked a little earlier about which is that learning from adversity we call it hack to attack so this is where something in your life or work hasn't perhaps worked out as well but you've actually used that as a real life experience that is now a fuel for your work what would be your hack to attack jim early on in my career this was probably in the first two three years 
the project I was working on, it was a grant project. It was coming to an end. It was in my dream job. I was just getting started. I was really beginning to find my passion for work and the contract was coming to an end. So I knew I was going to be out of work. I was nervous. I was scared. I was newly married. I, you know, didn't, uh, I looked down the road a couple of months and there was no job opportunity and I had bills to pay and like uh, just uncertain about what was going to happen to me. And then my supervisor came and told me, he said, I've recommended you for a job at San Jose State University. And I didn't even know where San Jose State University was at the time. I was living <laughs> in Austin, Texas. So I had to look at a map and see where San Jose, California was. And, and my wife and I noticed it was about 50 miles south of San Francisco. And we said, we'll take it. <laughs> I said, I'll take the job. And uh, we packed up and moved. I, I didn't even have a contract to go, but I had some faith that this put, that this prom, this commitment that was made to me was going to be there when I arrived. You know, to this day, I look back on that and it, it and, and other similar kinds of events, and I learned a very important lesson. Stuff happens. Yep. But if you've demonstrated some skill and you have a network of support, good stuff can result. Definitely so. Uh, you know, knowing that by demonstrating a, a, enough of a level of competence that other people have confidence in you and building relationships with other people early on uh, can benefit you for a lifetime. Uh, I have learned that lesson over and over and over again throughout my career. Yeah. I talk to my uh, my kids, or four kids, and, uh, and two are in work and one and two students. And I talk to them about the emotional piggy bank, you know, that pay it forward mm -hmm. and, and you know, put deposits in other people's emotional piggy bank, make them feel good because one day you're going to get a return on that investment. Absolutely. And, you know, that, that leads, that's always led me to the, the, the number one bit of advice I would, would give anyone. Uh, about how to become a better leader. Yeah. And the very last thing we get to do, and one of my favorite parts of the show, is we get to take you on a bit of time travel. You get to bump into Jim at 21, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and give Jim some advice. What would it be? Well, just back to that story, because I was a little older than 21, but not by too many years. And uh, that particular situation taught me that you can't do it alone. Yeah. I give that that piece of advice to any young person who, who, with whom I speak about what, what should I do to help myself in my career? What can I do to, to make sure that I can be successful? And I said, well, first of all, recognize you can't do it alone. No one who's ever gotten to the top is a self-made person. Very true. We hear that a lot. Uh, this person is, was a self-made millionaire. Well, really? <laughs> you know, all by yourself? You, you were not, nobody else helped yeah. you? There was no one else involved. You did it all alone. It's a really interesting cliche. You hear it all the time, but it's completely baloney. It's complete baloney. Yeah. If you recognize that it takes a mentor, it takes a coach, it takes uh, someone who's going to, a, a parent, uh, you know, you, you think back over your own life and think about anything that you accomplish that's meaningful to you. And I guarantee you there are other people involved who committed themselves to you and your success for you to get there. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, with, with that recognition, then, um, you know, I, th I think, you know, during every period of my life where I grew in advanced, uh, I can, you know, I can appoint the individuals who coached, advised, supported, helped me along the way. And with, with that knowledge, if I had that knowledge previously, uh, I, I would have benefited from it. Yeah. And I think everyone can benefit from just recognizing that uh, you, you, we grow and develop to the extent that uh, we have people who can help us along the way. Very much so. So what's next for you then, Jim? Well, we are, Barry and I are meeting on Monday to talk about the seventh edition of the Leadership Challenge and start to outline how it's going to be different. And because of the pandemic, there are a number of new issues we're going to tackle. And where are we going to gather the new stories and start taking a look at the data, particularly over the last year, and see what what else may have changed other than what we've already talked about, like around caring and support, for example, or diversity, equity, inclusion, yeah. that we might want to address. 
So it's going to be a year long project to, to look at the data and uh, interview some more people, particularly during these last 18 months, what they've experienced and then do the writing and sometime in 2023, we should have a new book out. Amazing. Amazing. And I should imagine, I already know the answer, I think, to this question from when we last met. Is there going to be a time where you think, right, that's enough, I'm retiring? I had a uh, 75-25 plan and the pandemic came along and helped me with that. Uh, when I was when I turned 75, I was going to cut back to 25% uh, of my time. And I revised that to be 80-20. So. <laughs> <laughs> so at 80, you still anticipate working 20% of the time. Yeah, I keep pushing it out. So, uh, but I, I am, I am dialing it back a bit to particularly on the business travel. That's, you know, our global travel is a bit tiring. And, and my family, uh, my son is engaged. He was supposed to get married. The pandemic happened that, so he and his fiance are still waiting for a time when people can gather in larger groups so we can have a big wedding and, celebrate that so there are a lot of family things coming up and hopefully grandkids soon and amazing uh, so we we will other other things are going to be happening in our lives we know that that are going to be where we want to spend our time well you've been a massive impact on my life jim and you've been a massive impact on millions of people around the world and now we have an extended family through the leadership hacker podcast it's just left for me to say i'm incredibly grateful for you taking some time out to be with us and part of our community so thanks for being on the show well steve thank you very much you are most gracious and i'm delighted to have this opportunity to chat with you thank you very much jim I genuinely want to say a heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your day to listen in too. We do this in the service of helping others and spreading the word of leadership. Without you listening in, there would be no show. So please subscribe now if you haven't done so already. Share this podcast with your communities and network and help us develop a community and a tribe of leadership hackers. And finally, if you'd like me to work with your senior team, your leadership community, keynote an event or you would like to sponsor an episode please connect with us via our social media and you can do that by following and liking our pages on twitter and facebook our handle there is at leadership hacker instagram you can find us there at the underscore leadership underscore hacker and at youtube we're just leadership hacker so that's me signing off i'm steve rush and i've been the leadership hacker